So to my right, this is Craig Moore. He's a tank expert and he's an author. This is Ed Francis. Y'all know him from the stream. Also a tank expert and author. And this is Rob Kogan. He's the curator here. And y'all know him from stream. <laughs> and so this is the Sherman Room. Very special, very holy place. And I want to show it off. So let's take a look. Y'all can, as you please, go around. And Rob is going to give us a little quick tour. Sure. So I'm going to change over to him. It's only about 30 seconds in. There's not a whole lot of people here. OK. But we'll just kind of go and see where sure. it goes from there. So here we are. Let's swap it back around. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the Sherman Room and a little All bit right. about what you do and what, how people can come and find it. So this is our American Armor Annex, as we call it. We have 37 uh, American pieces of armor in this building. Um, besides providing us another building to store armor here at the uh, United States Army Armor and Cavalry Collection, it also uh, serves as a classroom. So believe it or not, what we are in right now, this is a classroom for the U.S. Army. We train soldiers in this room on American armor history, talking about the developments of technology, uh, tactics, and doctrine uh, that we've used over the years as American tankers. Uh, and so what you'll see, of course, is we do have a lot of Sherman, so we do tend to call this uh, room the Sherman Shed or the Sherman House, the House of Sherman it gets called. Uh, I've heard a lot of soldiers actually refer to it as the tank barn, uh, so a lot of that's been used before. Uh, but it allows us to really go into depth about how tanks have changed over time in American history. Uh, not just how engineers have done that, but also how American soldiers have done that. A lot of the Shermans we have in this collection, they have a lot of differences. I mean, they're Sherman, so there's a lot of similarities, but they have a lot of differences that are very important. A lot of those differences were developed over World War II to make the Sherman more effective, and those changes came from the feedback provided by the soldiers, and that's what's important. Is we want these soldiers to know that they, too, can have a positive impact on the development of the armor force. And uh, so we'll walk down here a little bit. Of course, you can see we got our big tank recovery vehicles. We have reconnaissance vehicles over here that we use sometimes for the uh, reconnaissance classes as well. Greyhounds. A couple of anti tank guns down here as well. So, where are we starting and why do we want to start from sure. there? Sure. So, we're going to start with the American medium tank designs right at the start of uh, World War II in Europe. Not necessarily the start for World War II in America uh, in 1941 with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, but actually talk about it in the beginning uh, you know, as Germany invades Poland. So, in the mid 1930s, the United States Army. Uh, we were still using the uh, M1917 six-ton light tank. We were still using the Mark 8 heavy tank that we had used all the way back in 1919. Uh, Great Depression had also hurt the Army's budget a lot. Uh, but in the 1930s, we start developing newer tanks because we realized that we are going to have to increase our armor capability. The storm clouds have ruined over Europe. Uh, men like Adnan Chaffee, uh, Van Voorhees, Sereno Brett, these are all instructors either in the cavalry or the infantry armored forces. Uh, we realized we have to increase our capabilities, so we start designing new vehicles. This is actually a prototype of one of those vehicles. So this is the T5, what is referred to as the Phase 1 T5. Uh, this eventually becomes the M2 medium tank and the M2A1. Now, as the prototype, it's look kind of unique because those are semi-automatic 37mm guns. Uh, they actually work a lot like a Bofors anti-aircraft gun, so they're actually fairly rapid fire. But the M2 medium, of course, just uses a uh, manual loading 37 millimeter gun. Now the T5, you'll notice, it's very much focused on infantry support. So as you're coming around here, you notice that there are machine gun positions on each of the sponsons, all right? This tank is designed to cross trenches, and what do you do if you cross a trench and your enemy is just hiding in the trench waiting for you to go on past and then come up behind you? Well, these are ricochet plates. The whole idea is you drive over a trench, the enemy that you just drove over, he's just ducking down waiting for you to pass. Well, your two rear ma machine guns actually shoot your own tank. They shoot these plates and the bullets actually ricochet down behind you. And that's actually how you can clear the trench as you drive over it. Seems like a good idea. Eventually we phase this out because we realize that as you drive over a trench, your own infantry are falling behind you and the last thing you want to do is flash a bunch of bullets in front of them. But as you can see, this vehicle is very much still designed to support uh, infantry attacks, not necessarily fight armor on armor. So we eventually adopt this design as the M2 medium tank, and it's, it's quite popular, about 60 so are built. They serve in the Louisiana maneuvers, but eventually we decide that we want a tank with a bigger gun on it. An initial mock-up actually 
uh, because we couldn't put a 75 millimeter gun in the main turret, we did not have the capability at the time to build a bigger turret, which reversing gear powerful enough to turret. So we put the 75 millimeter gun on the side of the tank down here in the sponson where I'm tapping right now. So imagine if you will a 75 millimeter gun. We increase the the power of the suspension system, its capabilities, and that actually brings us to the tank over here on the other side. So now. We've gone from the M2 medium family of tanks, we're now at the M3 medium, which we of course call the Lee or the Grant, depending on which variant we're talking about. So the M3 Lee comes about, and uh, of course it's first uh, test and battles with the British Army. We actually give several to the British Army, M3s, uh, and they're actually quite popular because not only do they have this high explosive 75 millimeter gun, it's very good for uh, engaging infantry targets, bunkers, machine gun nests, anti-tank guns, you also have a 37 millimeter gun, uh, which actually has good armor penetration for the time period when this tank comes out. For some reason, a lot of people give the M3 a bad reputation, uh, just because it's designed, it's not traditional. But this tank was actually fairly successful. We knew it was going to be a stopgap tank. We knew eventually we wanted to have a tank that had a single turret with a main gun. But when this comes out, it's actually still doing great. And in fact, the M3 serves throughout most of the war in the uh, Burma and the uh, Indochina theater, where it's actually very, very successful. Now some things I'll point out, you'll notice that you have this armored, or not armored, but this weight here at the end of the gun. This tells me that this tank actually would have came equipped with a uh, stabilizing system. So this tank actually is equipped with a piece of equipment that maintains the gun's uh, aiming point uh, on a vertical axis. Mm -hmm. So as you're driving around, this gun will relatively stay close on target. It's not as good as Elwin Abrams today by any means. But because this is the earlier M2 gun, it's a little shorter in order to balance the gun right for that stabilizer, they had to put this collar weight on it. If you see a tank with the longer M3 75 millimeter gun, like the uh, M4 Sherman later on, that means uh, it does have the stabilizer and because the gun barrel is longer, you don't require this collar weight. You see with the short M2 barrel like this, there's no collar on it, that means that tank's not equipped with the vertical stabilizer. Uh, other point I'll point out is what's the difference between the M3 Lee and the M3 Grant? Well, that comes down to some design theory between us and the British Army and tank design. In the M3 Lee, you have a crew member whose sole job is operating the radios, and the radios are here in the hall. The British preferred their radios being within easy reach of the commanders, so when we start shipping them the M3, they request a different turret put on top, a much larger cast turret. And that's the Grant turret, of course. And that's because it has a bigger bustle, a bigger back end, if you will, on mm. the turret. And that's supposed to, uh, that's space for the radios to be right behind the tank commander. And it's the same thing with the original Sherman tank design, which we're about to move on to, uh, where you actually have that crew member, he's there for the radios, but we too also go, that's actually a really good idea, and we put the radios up in the turret so that the tank commander can just turn around and adjust them as necessary. So the M3 Lee, of course, is a stopgap tank. You know we want to put the 75 mm gun on the turret. We just don't have the, the manufacturing capability yet to produce a large cast turret, but eventually we do. And that takes us to the M4 Sherman line, which I'm about to take you down. Now, I'm going to take you down a little bit. I'm going to talk about some features. We might bounce around back and forth, so bear with me. Uh, the initial Sherman that's designed is the cast hull Sherman. We thought a cast hull as the major piece, we thought this would be the most efficient armor type. Um, because casting is one piece. Our welding really wasn't that good in the 1930s, and so we were afraid that if we had a tank with lots of welding, uh, the welds would be the weak spot. Before this, we had rivets. Rivets aren't really good because if a rivet gets hit, it can actually pop out and fly and bounce around inside the tank like a bullet. That's not very good for the crew. Uh, so originally we were aiming for a cast hold Sherman. But you'll notice there's both cast hold Sherbets, like this and for a one hull, and there's also welded hull Shermans, because we eventually realized uh, we can't rely on just one type of hull because we just don't have the, the factories to make all cast hulls. Uh, so we allow cast hulls and we allow welded hulls. So this particular tank, this M4A1, I'll point out, uh, is kind of special in that it's a one-off prototype. So this one, you'll notice, this is not a real gun on it. You'll actually notice this is a, a fake sleeve. You can see a joint. That's because this is actually a mechanized flamethrower, mechanical flamethrower, specifically this one, uh, the tank hull was sent and turret was sent to uh, MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and they actually developed this mechanical flamethrower. It actually had a range of something like 150 yards. So it, this tank doesn't even have to get close to, to light something on fire. It can actually stand back, launch its flame, uh, and eventually see ver versions of this tank, later improvements actually being used in the Pacific and then the Korean War. 
Alright, so over here we have an example of a welded hull tank. Now one thing I'll point out, this is a very special welded hull tank. This is not, this is not your normal welded hull tank. So this is an M4A3E2. So an M4 means welded hull, M4A1 hull, M4 hull welded. Alright, the A3 means that this is a later tank that had a Ford V8 engine. The Ford engine, we eventually decide, is the most uh, efficient engine, reliable engine. Uh, originally, the M4 and the M4A1 used aircraft engines, uh, radial engines. So we use a Ford V8 for this tank. And then what makes it E2 is this is what we call the jumbo. So essentially, this is two Sherman Halls slapped together. You have the main Sherman Hall, and then you have an additional armor plate. So you have about five inches of armor on this front that's actually thicker than a Tiger One's front. All right, so this is a fairly robust tank. And we designed this tank based on experiences that as we're pushing into Europe, uh, usually the lead tank takes the most hits because he's the first one to an ambush area. And so the Germans will light up that first tank. And if it can't get out of the engagement area, that causes issues because as it gets knocked out, it's now blocking the road, it's now blocking the way. This tank's designed to take a lick and keep on ticking, so to speak. Uh, these can take multiple hits, push through the engagement area, and allow the other tanks behind it to deploy and engage the German uh, threat. So that's why this design is extremely thick armor. Now this one's special. I mean, you can look at the mantle and see how thick that is. We're talking over a foot of armor now uh, on the front of the turret. We're talking dummy thick. Yes. Absolutely. Now when this tank thick. comes out, it's originally equipped with a 75 millimeter gun. Uh, starting in the March time period of 1945, some units, especially the Fourth Armor Division, they start converting them to 37 millimeter. Uh, and that's not, you can't do that with all Sherman tanks, but you can do it with the Jumbos because the Jumbos come with the T23 turret, mm. which is the same turret that all 76 millimeter gun Shermans do. Uh, so they can, all you literally have to do is unscrew the barrel from the 75 millimeter gun, screw on the 76 millimeter barrel, and then you'll notice that there's actually, you can see where some of the uh, armored collar that would have been around the gun shield, where it was cut away. And that's because, once again, we have a vertical stabilizer. You have to keep the gun balanced that the vert vertical stabilizer can do its job, and that's why that metal's cut away to balance the gun. So overall, this is this is your, your extremely armored, extremely thick Jumbo Sherman. You can even see the unique casting marks on the turret, and just see the thickness uh, in that armor plating. See the thickness. <laughs> so moving on to this next tank, so this is a type of tank you're going to see a lot in the United States. If you have a tank in your town that's a Sherman, it's a very good chance it's this type of tank. So this is an M4A3. So it's an M4 welded hull, A3 Ford V8 engine. So we know that this has a Ford engine. But what makes it uh, kind of unique from what you normally think of an M4A3 is that this is an early Ford built M4A3. So this is what we call a direct vision Sherman. And Initial Shermans, the original Sherman, this is what it, it looked like in the front. You'll see actually that the driver and the bow machine gunner, and this is your, who was supposed to be a radio man, you'll see that they actually had these little periscopes in the, or, uh, periscopes in the front, well actually vision slots in the front, that actually open and close. That's how the Sherman was originally designed. But we realized very quickly that that's a problem because that's a weak spot. And the last thing you want is an enemy round traveling at high velocity, slamming in here, and going right into your face. Uh, so we quickly get rid of that, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we did do to get rid of that because that serves as a weak spot. Now one thing I want to talk about is that it's direct vision Shermans that you're going to see going into combat in Kasserine Pass of uh, February 1943. Kasserine Pass really gives the Sherman take a bad rap. Uh, because during Kasserine Pass most of the Shermans are knocked out. Uh, and that's kind of where you hear the term of Shermans catch on fire easily. Here's the thing I want to point out with the Sherman tank. First of all, Kasserine Pass was a result of a lot of bad tactics. Uh, it was our first real engagement against German armored forces. First German and American tank on tank battle. But the thing to remember is, we're brand new guys on the field. We've never done this before. This is 1943, early 1943. All right, so what we're talking about is, Germans have been doing this since 1939, 1940, 1941, 1942. So by this point, I'm now taking a junior varsity team that's done some practices together. I'm now putting them against you know, collegiate champions. It, it just, it's not going to end well. Uh, so that's one reason the Sherman gets its bad reputation early on. Another reason uh, is the fact that the Sherman catches on fire easily, or so it seems. The issue, a lot of times, is described, oh, well, we use gasoline, the Germans use diesel. That's actually not the case at all. The Germans use gasoline as much as us. 
The big issue is the ammunition stowage on the M4 Sherman. On the older model of M4 Sherman, your ammunition is not stored in the turret like today's tanks, you know, like the M1 Abrams. The ammunition is right here. This is where your ammunition's at. You also have an ammunition rack back here, and you actually have ammunition stored here on the other side as well, right beside the crew. There's no firewall, there's no protection, there's no doors or anything. So besides being beside the crew, this is the proverbial broadside of the barn. If you're going to get hit in a tank, this is the area you're probably going to get hit in. And so what happens is a round comes in here, the ammunition goes up, you have a 60% chance of this tank completely going up in flames and the crew maybe has about 25 seconds at most to get out of the vehicle. All right, and at this time, you'll notice the hatches are quite small on the front. All right, those are only big enough to allow your head to come out. So it's going to take you a while. You have to turn in your seat, slowly work your arms up, push yourself out. The loader does not even have his own uh, escape hatch yet on top of the turret. So as you can see, this tank in some ways does deserve the moniker of a death trap because it's very hard for crew to evacuate and it is prone to those ammunition fires. But now we're gonna talk about how the Sherman starts improving. So this next tank here, Looks like an M4A1, basic 75 millimeter gun. Uh, but this is a little bit different, especially look at this track. You might say, wow, that track looks very German, metallic steel track, all right? That's because this is not a standard M4A1 Sherman. This is actually what you call a uh, Cruiser Mark I Grizzly. This is actually a Canadian built Sherman tank. The Canadians actually built some Shermans. Uh, the Canadians thought when they re-entered the war that they could start producing Shermans as well in their own country. They build some of these and then they very quickly realize that they will never reach the same production numbers that the United States does. We're producing plenty of tanks so they just get most of their tanks from us. Grizzly has some features or actually improvements upon the American Sherman. First of all, the track system. This is a very Canadian design. This is called Canadian dry pen. What they did was they actually took the best features from British, American, and German tracks, slammed it all together and just made what they thought was a very efficient track system. So yes, it looks very, 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 very German, but you also have this dry pin system, and by dry, I mean that there's no rubber or anything else in there uh, for the pin, it just slides in. Uh, but it's a different pitch, I mean, it's a different width than American track. So you can identify Grizzly, first of all, by this type of track, but you also notice that the sprocket here is very, very different than American sprockets. Now one thing you'll notice with the Grizzly tank is that there's these large welded plates on the side. And the way these, these plates are cut and welded, this is a very, very, I guess you could say birthmark for a grizzly. These are very grizzly. This is what we call applique armor. And this is how we first try to solve the issue of the ammunition fires in the Sherman. So of course we go ahead, simplest thing to do, reinforce where the ammunition is stowed. All right, so that's what we're going to do to try to prevent these ammunition fires. And it does help a little bit. We also start, elimin st uh, start eliminating the direct vision slots. Now I'm going to show you an American tank uh, that is very typical for what we were using in Normandy in the summer of 1944. This particular vehicle here. So this has a lot of proof. This is like your mid-war Sherman. And this is what you're going to really see landing on the beaches and fighting in the Bocage in France. So, M4, welded hull, radio aircraft engine, 75 millimeter gun. All right, now we see there's applique armor on the front of the hull as well to protect the driver and the bow gunner. You can see these heavy welds here. But this plane is to protect them as well. You also see, once again, we have the applique armor on the side of the hull to protect the ammunition. But now look at the turret. We even have it on the turret there. On the Grizzly, they actually increase the thickness of the armor on the turret, but we add applique armor on the turret. And the reason why is because we quickly realized that when we make the turret, we remove steel on the inside of the turret for the uh, gunner's controls. In order to fit the gunner and his controls in the turret, we have to remove steel on the inside. So we quickly realized that's a weak spot and we start putting applique armor on the outside to protect him as well. Now this tank also has a cool feature. Uh, there's actually two cool features with this tank. So first of all, there's actually an added steel plate on the back. That is a very, very common uh, upgrade that was done for tanks that were fighting in Normandy. Uh, they added this because they realized the back plating was also a little weak, so we added more steel in the back. And the turret uh, has a new feature for the loader. Now there is not a loader's hatch on this type of vehicle. But one thing that the British came up with is something they call the fixed quick gun shield. So in your Sherman tank, around this, the gun breech, you have a, a steel shield, sheet metal shield. Uh, and that's, of course, when the gun recoils back, you don't get an armor leg caught in it because that's very bad for the crew as well. Uh, but the problem with that is, since there's no loader's hatch, if the tank catches on fire, loader has to 
crawl underneath that gun shield and get out and through. Well, the British devised a collapsible gun shield where literally the loader could remove some pins, swing the gun shield out of the way, he could get out faster. And this tank includes that quick fix. So we're now starting to make the Sherman more efficient, safer for the crew. Now we're gonna talk about more ways to make the Sherman better. Alright, so this is your Sherman. Oh, actually I'm out of order here. So we're going to talk about a different kind of Sherman that comes out during Normandy. So this is an M4105 Sherman. Alright, this Sherman comes now not with a 75mm gun, not with the later 76mm gun. This now has a 105mm howitzer. This is how this tank is used. Every tank company gets one of these. Every tank battalion has three of them up at the battalion headquarters. Now most battalions, what they'll do is they'll take the, the three that are down at the company and they consolidate them up at the battalion. So now you actually have six of these working as one battery. And this tank is originally designed to use its high explosive capable gun to take out bunkers, uh, built up positions, um, using it for market smoke. But what they really get used for is they now become the tank battalion's personal field artillery. You'll see photos of these lined up, all six of them, they're firing away, and the ground's just covered with shells. So if you're a tank battalion and you need artillery support, this is the best thing you can have because instead of having to work with a separate field artillery unit, you have your own personal field artillery. Contrary to popular belief, this tank is not designed with its 105mm gun to actually fight other tanks. In fact, when these are first produced and throughout most of World War II, they don't even have any mechanical uh, powered gear in the turret to allow the turret to rotate. This turret you have to rotate using cranks. All right, so it's a very slow, meticulous turret to turn. This is designed for fire support purposes. But this is the first tank that comes out, uh, really, that has what we call a large hatch Sherman hull. You'll notice now, instead of having the hoods on the earlier variants of the Sherman, all right, we changed the angle of the Sherman tank, and now there's one big flat piece here. So first of all, this is one big flat piece of steel, which means it's gonna be stronger if it gets hit. And now we have made the hatches bigger, which means if you have to get out of the driver and bow gutters position, it's much quicker for you to get out. You essentially open hatch, stand up, you're out. All right. At the same time, we now introduce a large hatch, Sherman, with the 75 millimeter gun. Right. And this is gonna become your workhorse. This is the most preferred variant of the Sherman as we go into late 1944, all right? So, large hatch Sherman, 75 millimeter gun. We now have a loader's hatch on top. So yay for the loader, he can get out when he needs to now. But the biggest change is, this is also what we refer to as a wet hulled Sherman. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have dry hulled Shermans and wet hulled Shermans. Dry hulled Shermans are the Shermans that had the ammo on the sides, like I already pointed out in the ammo racks. A wet hulled Sherman, first thing we do is we take the ammunition here on the side. We take it away from the proverbial broadside of the barn and we now put it on the bottom of the Sherman tank. So first of all, it's out of the way. It's out of the way of where it's most likely to get shot. And now, the rounds are actually stored in ammunition lockers underneath the vehicle, and they're in little armored sleeves in these lockers, and in between the sleeves, we fill it with ethanol glycol, essentially antifreeze. And you might wonder, well, why are we putting this liquid in between all the tank rounds? Well, if a piece of shrapnel or a tank round goes through the bottom of the tank, does happen to go down there, and one of those armored sleeves is compromised, and that tank round starts to cook off, well, because that sleeve's been broken open, it now fills up with ethanol glycol. It's a fire suppressant system, all right? So now the rounds, before they can cook off, they're flooded with this ethanol glycol that, that moves in, puts out the fire. It's an automatic fire suppression system. We go now from Sherman's uh, with a burnout rate of 60%. So cast and pass, if a Sherman gets hit, it has a 60% chance of catching on fire. We go from 60% to, in some cases, in some units, only 15%, which is actually lower than most German tanks of World War II. So now the Sherman has actually become quite an efficient piece. But we're not done yet. We have a few things we're gonna add, and that's where we go to these two tanks that finish out World War II for us, and will take us actually into the Korean War. These are what we call HVSS Shermans. All right, so first of all, we change the suspension system. The suspension system you saw on those Shermans, that's a vertical volute spring suspension system. This is the beefed up version. This is what we call, if you bring the camera out, this is now the horizontal, as you can see, the spring is horizontal. All right, this is the horizontal uh, volute spring suspension system. All right, it's also got wider track, which means better flotation, better maneuverability of the tank. But the biggest change you'll notice on this tank, and this starts coming about in July of 1944, is these tanks now have the T23 turret, they no longer have the wrap order rounded turret. 
They now have the T23 turret, which allows us to have the 76 millimeter gun. And the 76 millimeter round has much better armor uh, piercing capability. And it's this Sherman that will take us to the end of World War II. And when the Korean War kicks off, yes, by that point we have the M26 and even uh, eventually the M46 uh, family of tanks. But we actually still use the Sherman because it is so reliable compared to the M26, which is using the same engine, the same Ford V8 engine of a much greater weight. And this tank has no problems taking out T-34 85s uh, in North Korea. So one thing I want to point out, from the T-5, which becomes the M2 medium in 1938, to this tank, we're talking the span of only five and a half years. All right, so rapid techno technology changes happening at that time. Uh, it just goes to show how we took the standard M4 Sherman and we really made it, actually, in my opinion, a very war-winning uh, war tank uh, for us. Awesome. Thank you for showing us the Sherman oh, no story. Problem. There are a few more vehicles in this hall. Would you mind showing us a run-through oh, of sure. the rest? So here we have two Stuarts. So this is the standard light American tank uh, throughout most of World War II. Uh, so in our army, we had light, medium, and heavy tanks. Light tanks, uh, they conducted security or reconnaissance operations. Uh, they could also uh, move a little more rapid. So initially, we were supposed to have entire units of light tanks, uh, and their job was kind of almost like today's modern uh, mechanized cavalry. Uh, but we have two different types here. So this is an M3 Stuart. This is the original Stuart, based off the M2 uh, light tank at the before World War II. Uh, Armor 37 millimeter gun, very, very classic pre-World War II haul. All right, so you have ballistic bolt construction, not riveted, but not welded, but ballistic bolts. Um, and you would have four crew members. So you have a driver, you have a bow machine gunner who also operates the radio, you have the tank commander who is also your gunner, and you have a loader to assist him who could gun if he needed to, but uh, really in this turret, because this is a later M3, would not work. So this is actually, I should correct this, this is actually an M3A1. So the original M3 Stuart had a big tall cupola on it, uh, and if you were the gunner slash commander and the loader, you actually had to stand with the turret the whole time, and if you moved the turret, you actually had to hand crank it around and move with it. This is an M3A1, so this actually has a turret basket in it, and actually has seats. So DA, now the commander and loader, uh, they get and sit down, and the turret's now powered. This vehicle, we changed the hull, we increased its armor thickness, we put in two Cadillac engines, we're going fancy now, and it becomes the M5A1 Stuart eventually. And so this is what we're using really as we invade your mainland Europe uh, and into 1944. So same basic tank, but with a lot of improvements at it. We're always improving our vehicles. Now, what it gets replaced by, oh, so now we really up the ante for a light tank. This is a 75 millimeter armed M24 Chaffee. And this tank, when it comes out, this changes the ball game for light tanks. Because light tanks really, by 1944, that 37 millimeter is not gonna do a whole lot of damage to another tank. But this M24, not only can it do the job of a light tank, but now it can fight other tanks. And this M24 is actually really cool if you come over here, Sophie, and want to show you. So after World War II, of course, U.S. Army, we have lots of tanks over in Europe. Believe it or not, we decide it's actually cheaper to leave the tanks over there than bring them back here to the United States. And that's actually why Europe, uh, it's actually very easy in Europe to find American World War II armor still operating. This tank actually at one point served in the French Army before coming back to the United States. I mean, you actually see the French rebuild plate right here. So that actually shows where it was rebuilt, out, rebuilt at. Uh, and then someone at some point, for good luck, attached a French spring to it. Hey, that's cool. Now, you might ask, what do we do after this? Well, as we start going to the Cold War era, we start having issues with using light tanks. Because tanks now, they're becoming bigger, they're becoming faster, they're becoming stronger. Uh, and so we start entering the era of the main battle tank, a tank that has got the right combination of firepower and armor that's able to pretty much do all the jobs that light, medium, and heavy tanks used to be able to do. Unfortunately for the M41 Walker Bulldog you see here, uh, that pretty much is the nail in the coffin for it. So by the time this tank comes out, it's really too heavy to be a true light tank. And it's a 6mm gun it is not powerful enough to really make it effective against the Russian, or I should say Soviet T-55s that are out at that point. So while the Walker itself is a very great design tank, unfortunately when it comes out, it's already becoming obsolete. So you don't really see it used too much. The last hurrah in the United States Army for the light tank is actually a vehicle behind you, so technically it's not a light tank, it's actually an armored reconnaissance vehicle. All right, and this is, of course, the M511 Sheridan. By the time the Sheridan is designed, the Army has already decided light tanks, they're not going to cut anymore, so they cut light tank programs. So the only way this tank comes into existence 
is by calling an armored reconnaissance vehicle. Why do we do that? Because we want to have an armored fighting vehicle for airborne troops, for light cavalry units as well. Uh, very, very, uh, very interesting vehicle in that it introduces the 152 millimeter gun rocket launcher system, which of course uses the Shillelagh missile. First sees action in Vietnam. Unfortunately, the first one that sees action is knocked out within 24 hours. So they were realized there's some shortcomings to this tank. It uses a lot of aluminum in order to keep itself light. There's some issues with the rounds in the Shillelagh uh, missile system. If they actually get wet, the type of powder and casing they use, uh, if it gets wet, it becomes flammable, believe it or not. And so there's some, some, some issues with crew safety of the vehicle. Well, but these actually served all the way through the 1991 uh, Gulf War and actually quite successfully. Uh, Panama, um, a couple other operations in South America, they're actually very, very uh, efficient in those actions as well. Do you want me to continue on, or yeah. you, want to, you want to go this way? Okay. We have some hefty buddies over right. here. Okay. So, we talked about the Sherman tank. Well, when you come out of a tank design, if you're smart, you're always looking at, well, what should my next design be? You don't rest on your laurels. The U.S. Army was doing the same thing with the M4 Sherman. Even though we use it through World War II, during the war, we were constantly looking at other designs to replace the Sherman. This here, this is one of those designs as well. I'm going to go to this vehicle, that vehicle, and then all right, so this is a T-23 medium tank. The T-20 series of tanks was the project to replace the Sherman. And with the T-23, what we were looking at is a whole different chassis suspension system and putting a 76 millimeter gun on a tank. At this point, Sherman only has 75 millimeter gun. Now, pretty cool tank. It actually has a electric transmission in it. Uh, very advanced for its time, and it actually uses the Ford V8 engine that we talked about the Sherman. But the transmission is kind of cool because the driver's controls are actually on cables. And if the driver wants to, he can disconnect the cables, pass them up to the tank commander, and the tank commander can actually drive the tank from his position. So if we're talking like a long road march, of course your driver's been driving for four or five hours at a time, you need to give him a break, the tank commander can just take over the controls from his position if he needs to. Um, there, I could see some use for that, but really on a, on a battlefield, that's not gonna be really efficient. It's kind of more of a, a cool feature uh, the cables were actually long enough, if you wanted to, you could get out of the driver's hatch, take the controls in your hand, and you could actually walk with the tank as you drove it. Kind of cool, but the cables, of course, are too short for that to be of any value. Uh, you know, it's more of a whiz-bang, that's really kind of cool feature uh, that we have. Eventually, we decide that that transmission system probably too complicated for a battlefield tank. But, you really like the turret. I mentioned this is the T-23 tank. You may have heard me mention that the 76 millimeter arm Sherman we were just talking about is the T-23 turret. Well, that's where this turret comes from. It's from the T-23 tank. We actually, believe it or not, we built 200 of these and they actually served in the United States. And now there's only a handful left. We actually have one here and then two at our restoration shop. And I think those may be the only ones left in the world. Uh, but this one's in pretty good shape. Uh, her internals are actually fantastic. Uh, but that kind of gives you an idea of some of the things we're looking at. Eventually, besides the transmission being complicated, we also say, well, the Sherman's doing a good enough job. Why change our entire logistics chain? You know, if we have all these spare parts to keep the Sherman going, why are we going to change all that by bringing in a new tank that's just going to mess everything up? So the Sherman keeps fighting. But we take this design, we start improving upon it. We go from it being a medium tank to a heavy tank, and that's when we get this bad boy over here. Ah, uh, yes. So this is the T26E3. This is the original Pershing. So before it becomes standardized as the M26, it's the T26E3. So now we have a 90 millimeter gun capable of taking out German tanks with ease. All right, we go from the original uh, balloon spring suspension systems that we used on the Sherman tank and the T23 over here. So now we are using torsion bar suspension systems. All right, now the way a torsion bar suspension system, on the other tanks you have springs going up and down. Torsion bar suspension system, the way it works, your road wheel, is on a road wheel arm, and that road wheel arm is attached to essentially a very strong, high quality steel uh, torsion bar that goes the whole way through. And that torsion bar provides suspension by twisting. I mean, I'm talking a solid piece of steel, it's not rotating, the bar twists, believe it or not. And that provides excellent suspension system for a heavy vehicle. And that's why all heavy vehicles today essentially use a torsion bar suspension system. The really the only other common suspension system used on large vehicles today is a, a hydro, uh, hydraulic style suspension system, but still very similar uh, in layout. All right. But this tank, of course, is introduced in the end of 19, uh, excuse me, is introduced in early 1945. So from the time we invade Normandy to the time we get to the Battle of Bulge, 
U.S. Army really doesn't encounter a lot of German tanks. Uh, different for the British outside the city of uh, Caen in northern France. That's a whole different kind of battle. But for us, we really don't fight a lot of German armor. Our tanks are mostly fighting against anti-tank guns and infantry teams. So eventually what happens is the Battle of Balch happens to realize, look, we're going to keep facing more German tanks as we continue our push into the heart of the Third Reich. And so one of the things we do is we create Mission Zebra. Mission Zebra is this special task force of the Ordnance Corps. They rush forward the T26E3s. They also rush forward several heavy uh, artillery pieces forward. And it's pretty much heavy guns going forward and we're trying to test them out. Uh, one, make sure that they actually work. And two, they're going to serve as the spearheads of their units. And that's of course why you see a, a T26E3, much like this one, going into battle in the city of Cologne or Cologne as a German state, and it kills the Panther, of course, uh, at the uh, uh, Cologne Cathedral uh, in March of 1945. That's why this tank, of course, becomes very famous in World War II. But believe it or not, though, T-26 has issues, too. It's the same engine as the Sherman tank, uh, but this now weighs about 12 tons more, 10 to 12 tons more. So there's going to be some issues with that, and these are a little bit finicky. So yes, you got great gun, you got good armor, but now you're starting to lose your reliability and maneuverability. That's why even when the Korean War kicks off, you're still going to be using the M4 Sherman in the mountains of Korea. And the last armored vehicle I'll talk about here, all right, this is our M36, all right? So this is a tank destroyer. What do I mean by tank destroyer? In the United States Army, we have our own concept of what a tank destroyer is. The tanks originally were supposed to support the infantry attacks. That was the original concept. Tank destroyers were going to be held in reserve, and what a tank destroyer is, it uses a tank chassis. So what we see here is the M4 chassis. And it has a much more powerful gun, but a lot less armor. And the idea is it's much more uh, maneuverable on a battlefield, a little bit faster. And so the idea was your tanks would be fighting forward, and lo and behold, we identify uh, the enemy's armor uh, force coming forward. This would rush forward, engage the enemy's armored column, destroy it, and then retreat back to uh, your friendly lines and reform it, prepare to do it again. The problem is that concept was developed pretty much in 1940, watching Blitzkrieg tactics in France. By the time we get into the war, the Germans really aren't using those original Blitzkrieg tactics. Uh, and so these vehicles really just get used as other tanks. Now the M36 is special because it starts out initially as the M10 with a three inch gun. All right, but this particular one has a 90 millimeter gun, the same 90 millimeter gun as the Pershing, but it's coming out much earlier. All right, so that's why sometimes you hear the M36, you hear the term slugger as a nickname used for it. Some debate about how official that is, uh, but a very efficient vehicle at knocking out German tanks. Now this particular one, first of all, at some point it received an upgrade, so it has an armored roof on it. Tank destroyers, American tank destroyers tend to be open topped. This one has an upgrade to put on a roof on. And then this one actually eventually, at some point, wound up in Yugoslavia after World War II. Uh, Yugoslavia kind of teetered between being friendly with the Soviets, being friendly with NATO, and so it kind of used both countries' technology. So case in point, this M36 Yugoslavia uses, but eventually the engines start wearing out. So what do they do? You'll notice that this box back here has been welded on. This is an extension to the engine compartment. And that's because they actually eventually put a Russian V12 diesel, much like on your T-34 or your T-55, inside this vehicle to keep it going so that they can use it for years to come. Another cool feature uh, I could show you with this tank, as we come around here to the front, All right, if we look at the front of the M36, now this is from its days fine uh, in Yugoslavia. All right, you'll see here we have a weld patch and we have these very interesting marks on the front. This is splash damage, most likely from a rocket-propelled grenade. So the rocket-propelled grenade would have hit here, penetrate on the inside, we've looked at damage, and then this is the splash caused by that shape charge round splashing into the armor. All right, and this all happens quite quickly. All right, and it's just kind of a cool pattern you see, but this, of course, is very deadly. You can just see how much damage pitting that did to the armor in that second. So here we can actually see battlefield damage on this vehicle. And so in the 1990s, when we start doing peacekeeping operations and what because, you know, the Balkans, uh, Yugoslavia, of course, breaks up. Thank you. Uh, breaks up. Uh, this comes back to the United States. Now, one thing I want to point out, because Ed just pointed out, uh, to me to point out, is, so tank destroyers, I mentioned, they don't have a uh, lot of armor on them to keep them maneuverable. Well, someone in the Ordnance Corps did think, probably want to be able, though, to up armor them. So you'll notice a lot of these bolts on the front. 
This is actually for adding add-on armor. Believe it or not, you can unbolt these, apply your add-on armor sheets over top, would increase the thickness to a traditional tank thickness, and then bolt it back on. Uh, but these never really see use overseas. You actually don't see these being used caught. There's a couple photos floating around of them being used for testing, but never gets really used overseas. And so that is the M36 tank. Super or cool. tank destroyer, excuse me. Right on. Well, thank you so much for your talk. Oh, no problem. So this is again, we call this the Sherman Shed. And this is super cool. And this here is at the National Armor and Cap Collection here at Fort Benning, up among some incredibly expansive other facilities with tanks. And just let me swap a view. And here's Rob again. And there's Ed again over there. Oh. Hello, Ed. Hello. So, this was our tank talk here at the Sherman Shack. And you can actually come see this place. They have open houses and go and find, connect with the National Armor and Cav Collections Facebook group. Yes, uh, if you look up United States Army Armor and Cavalry Collection, uh, we try to keep, keep a good amount of updates on our social media. Yeah, and so. You guys can find out ahead of time when they're going to do an open house, you can come see this facility and these tanks for yourself. So keep your eyes open over there because this is super awesome. You've got to see this in person. It's super great. This blew my mind the first time and I knew I had to show it off when I heard we were coming back. So thanks everybody for hanging out. Our next stream will be another yard with tanks and I got to recharge my phone again. So that'll be in a little bit and we'll see what we can get. It might be a little short, but there's a lot. So thanks everybody for hanging out and I will see you guys with Rob and Ed and Craig next time. Take care.